My name is Tom Winter, and I'm from the University of Utah, and I'll be speaking about ultrasound of the endometrium. Well, for the next 45 minutes, we're going to be talking about ultrasound of the endometrium. It's a nice topic because it can be covered pretty much completely in one session right here. And we'll talk about why we worry, a little bit on terminology and technique. We'll discuss what's abnormal in a variety of clinical scenarios. We'll talk about abnormalities seen on transvaginal ultrasound, other competing diagnostic modalities like endometrial biopsy or DNC, and then we'll finish up with a lecture within a lecture of saline infusion sonohysterography. So why do we worry? About 10% of postmenopausal women will have bleeding. And of that 10%, 10% of those will have endometrial cancer. And even though endometrial cancer is predominantly a disease of postmenopausal women, 5 to 10% of cases will occur in premenopausal women. It's the most common GYN malignancy, about 40,000 cases per year in the United States. And it's the fourth most common cancer in women following breast, lung, and colon. But fortunately, because it's detected early due to the abnormal bleeding, and because we have reasonable treatments for it, it accounts for only 1.5% of cancer deaths. So which of the following statements describes endometrial cancer? All of these are true except it's the fourth most common cause of cancer in women. 5 to 10% of cancer occurs in women under the age of 40 or 50. It's the number one cause of bleeding. There are 40,000 new cases per year in the U.S. And there are a variety of risk factors. So all of these are true except it is not the number one cause of postmenopausal bleeding. It's the cause we worry about, but atrophy is actually the number one cause. So there's a variety of specific terms with unique meanings regarding uh, abnormal bleeding, but if you're a lumper like I am, you can skip to the bottom and call all of the above abnormal uterine bleeding. How do we measure the endometrium? It's very important that we spend time on technique and try to do things right. Here's a quote from John Wooden, the most famous basketball coach of all times, talking about the importance of attention to the little details. So we want to measure the endometrium transvaginally with an empty bladder. We want to measure it in the sagittal plane. We want to measure the thickest portion. We exclude any fluid in the endometrial cavity from our measurement. We visualize the entire endometrium. And remember that 5 to 10% of the time, you're not going to be able to see the endometrium. You're going to have fibroids or positioning or something that gets in your way, and that's OK. So we measure it transvaginally, and this is just an example from a beautiful paper by Ruth showing how you can see the polyp transabdominally, but as we all know, it's much better seen transvaginally. We exclude the hypoechoic inner myometrium. So as you see on this slide, we measure between the arrows, and we don't include the hypoechoic halo. That's just convention. If you have fluid, you measure each wall and add them together, and you don't include the central thickness of the fluid, which makes intuitive sense. So in this case, the reported thickness would be 4.3 millimeters, 0.2 and 0.23. It's really important that we sweep the entire endometrium. You don't want to just take pictures like in the top left and say, oh, everything's normal, because then when you move your probe off to the side there, all of a sudden we have a stage one adenocarcinoma that's not seen on the initial image. And again, just to make this point, 5, 10% of the time, whatever, you're not going to be able to see the entire endometrium. You, that's OK, because the message we want to give our patients is that if we call the ultrasound normal, you do not have endometrial cancer. If we can't see everything, that's OK, but we just need to go to another case, another assessment modality. So in this case, we have a large fibroid up there, and it turned out that there was a stage 2B endometrial cancer here. Don't accept indistinct endometrial margins. Endometrial cancer can be infiltrative. So you can see on our right towards the cervix, we have a sharp line. But towards the left, it's just kind of gray and blending in. And this was a grade 2 adenocarcinoma. So regarding proper measurement of endometrial thickness, all of the following are true, except you need to do it transvaginally. You need to do it in the sagittal plane. It should be made at the thickest portion of the stripe. Fluid within the cavity should be included in the thickness. 
and indistinct margins should make you worry about cancer. And all of these are true, except as we talked about, we do not include fluid within the cavity. So what's abnormal? And that depends on the clinical scenario. So we'll go through a couple different clinical scenarios here. Number one is premenopausal, and obviously um, endometrial thickness changes depending where you are in your cycle, but a rough rule of thumb is 15 millimeters. So here are just a series of different patients illustrating the endometrial cavity at different portions of the cycle. Here we have a 20-year-old on oral contraceptives on day four. It's just thin and atrophic. Here on day seven, you see the periovulatory or beginning periovulatory appearance. It's kind of trilaminar or three layers. On day 14, you get the classic periovulatory trilaminar appearance. On day 17, it starts to thicken up and you get this echogenic material. And then as we get into the late luteal phase, the entire endometrium, these are two different patients, is just very thickened right there. So that's the normal spectrum from menses to right before the next menses. And remember that this 15 millimeters is not a perfect threshold there. This is a two and a half centimeter endometrium in a 29 year old asymptomatic patient uh, one day before she's supposed to get her period. And she's asymptomatic, she's young, this is gonna be normal here. So what you wanna do to try to obviate these problems is schedule people for um, their ultrasounds on the early part of their cycle, and then you won't run into the conundrum posed by the secretory phase. Scenario number two is postmenopausal bleeding, and basically under five millimeters is normal. Some people used four, but the majority of everybody uses five millimeters there. Remember that there are some nuances to this five millimeters. If you have a focal endometrial abnormality, that's abnormal, even if it's under five. So if it goes 1, 1, 1, 4.9, 1, 1, 1, that's abnormal there. We talked about an indistinct appearance. Most of the time it's normal, but it could be cancer. And 5 to 10% of the time it's going to be non-diagnostic because you can't see, generally due to fibroids. Remember not to scare your patient. Just because the ultrasound isn't under 5 millimeters doesn't mean she has cancer. It just means that we need to go to a more definitive test. The whole goal of ultrasound is to have something that when it's normal, there is not any cancer. Third scenario is the postmenopausal patient on hormone replacement therapy. And there have been a lot of oscillations in whether women are being offered peri or postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy over time. Uh, but bottom line, we keep the five millimeter threshold. We're not using the eight millimeter threshold that a lot of people talk about, but that's not evidence-based medicine right there. We keep five millimeters because if it's under five, it's not cancer. We know we're gonna have more false positives because the hormone replacement is going to increase the stripe thickness, but there are enough cancers between five and eight that we keep the five millimeter threshold and accept more false positives. And here's a 55-year-old on unopposed estrogen for five years after menopause, and you can see the um, thickened stripe with blood flow. What about postmenopausal patient but not bleeding? You know, should we offer additional investigations to asymptomatic women with an increased stripe? This is very controversial. I think the best paper out there is from UCSF. It's a meta-analysis. And basically, they said that over 11 millimeters is your, when you pull the trigger to offer endometrial biopsy, whereas under 11 millimeters, um, the risk-benefit ratio isn't appropriate there. You can argue this. It was a meta-analysis, but it's probably the best data that we have. All the gynocs that I've talked to think this is reasonable. Remember, we are not offering a screening exam here. This is just when grandma comes in, she's not bleeding, and we're looking for an endexal mass or appendicitis or whatever, and we happen to see something over 11 millimeters. The last scenario is tamoxifen. As we all know, tamoxifen is great at treating breast cancer. It halves the risk of breast cancer recurrence, but it does increase the risk of endometrial issues. Um, this problem may be going away as we're getting some more selective estrogen receptor modulators, but they're still not in wide use right now. And so just as in patients on hormone therapy, the endometrium in patients on tamoxifen is going to be abnormal.
Um, it stays abnormal for a long time after you quit taking it. It decreases about a mil per year right there. So if you've been on tamoxifen for five years, it may take a while for it to come back down to normal. Bottom line, there's a little bit of controversy out there, but all the gynecologists I talk to say we really shouldn't be imaging women on tamoxifen because it's going to look abnormal, we're going to get worried, so they more or less treat symptoms. If the patient's bleeding, then they go ahead and deal with it. So you can see in this case here, we have a 34 millimeter thick endometrium. A couple months later, it's five centimeters thick, looks very abnormal, and these turned out to be benign polyps. So to sum up all of this complex stuff here, postmenopausal with bleeding, this is the most important category, over five millimeters, it doesn't mean you have cancer, but we need to evaluate. If you're postmenopausal bleeding on hormones, if you're postmenopausal bleeding on tamoxifen, we still use five millimeters. If you're postmenopausal and you're not bleeding, we use 11 millimeters. And if you're premenopausal, we use 15 millimeters. This is very complex. Ruth did a superb job writing up the consensus statement. So take a look at that if you have other questions. So now let's move on to abnormalities seen on transvaginal ultrasound. Um, as we said before at the beginning of the lecture, most women, fortunately, who are bleeding, who are postmenopausal, don't have cancer. Two-thirds of the time, it's atrophy. So here's a great appearance of an atrophic endometrium that just needs medical management, doesn't need anything else. We can see polyps transvaginally. Here's a classic appearance of a polyp. This is not an SIS. This is a regular vaginal scan. This is kind of an interesting one because, again, this is not an SIS, but you can see the polyp kind of peristalsing back and forth with myometrial contractions there. It has the classic appearance of a polyp with a single blood vessel going into the stalk right there, and this was a benign polyp. We've all seen a million fibroids. Um, the key thing here is submucosal location since we're worried about abnormal bleeding. And then the thing that we worry about is endometrial cancer. And even though this appearance here is great for a polyp, it's homogeneous, it's hyperechoic, 99% um, of this was benign polyp at surgery, but 1% in the top left corner, there was a focus of grade one adenocarcinoma there. So focal masses are surgical masses, they generally come out. Let's talk about some of the other diagnostic modalities out there. Um, and again, it's not that something is good and something is bad, each has strengths and weaknesses. Now the classic imaging modality was the hysterosalpingogram, and we did that in the old days before we had something better, but it has completely fallen out of favor for evaluation of the endometrium. It has way too many false positives, way too many false negatives. Here are two different REI patients who had focal masses. One of these turned out to be a polyp, one turned out to be a cancer. So the only thing we're doing these for now is tubal patency. Dilation and curatage, or as my mother-in-law calls it, dust and clean. This is the classic diagnostic test. Um, because of the morbidity, discomfort, cost involved, it is no longer a diagnostic test. It's just a therapeutic option. The key thing about DNC is remember that you only sample 10 to 20% of the endometrial cavity. So it's good for endometrial cancers because cancers tend to be large and they tend to shed cells. But for focal lesions, it's not nearly as good. What's replaced uh, DNC from a diagnostic standpoint is the endometrial biopsy right there, or EMB. And there's a bazillion different catheters out there, but basically you put them up and you sample some of the cells. This only samples 15% of the endometrial service. So again, it's very good, it's not perfect, and there are some papers that say that endometrial biopsy is far from perfect, but in general, most people say that endometrial biopsy is good for cancer, but it's horrendous for polyps. In the Sloan Kettering study, it picked up only 4% of polyps. And as we try to distinguish between using um, endometrial biopsy versus SIS, endometrial biopsy hurts a lot more than SIS. Hysteroscopy is kind of the gold standard. Remember, there are two different types. There's in the office with the little medaz and fentanyl, and there's in the operating room. We fill the cavity with fluid, put in our scope right there. Obviously, the operating room version, you can use bigger scopes and see a lot more and do more, but it's a lot more costly and has more morbidity there. And there's a lot of papers that says that SIS is as good or better than hysteroscopy in finding lesions. Obviously, we can't do something about the lesions once we find them, though, with SIS.
Let's now talk about uh, saline infusion sonohistorography, which I think is really underutilized um, in evaluation of the endometrium. And we'll divide this lecture within a lecture to an overview, technique, and then a bunch of examples. And even if you do not do um, SIS, although I hope you consider it, I think looking at all these examples will make you much better sonographer. So there's a whole bunch of different synonyms out there for SIS there, and it's a mixture of the etymology of Greek and Latin, but it literally means writing on the uterus with sound there. Primacy is always tough to distinguish, but the first paper I found was by Nanini in 1981. Um, it's still an active research area, you know, over a five or six year period, I found about 70 citations, and that was just searching for one word. If you search for all the other synonyms, you'd find a lot more. We average about two a week. You know, it's not high volume, but it's solid. It's not a difficult study to perform. One of the key things to remember about SIS or any screening test is that some expert in their ivory tower may have a wonderful test, but if you and I can't use it, and we have 300 million people in America, it's not going to be a good test there. So one of the beautiful things about SIS is that the average person it works great for. And there was one trial where they compared nurses to second year resis, to fourth year resis, to fellows, and found equal accuracy. They, uh, another person basically said the same thing there. Now remember when we talk about SIS, we always perform a full transvaginal ultrasound as part and parcel of it. We look at the uterus, we measure the fibroids that are sticking off to the side, but we're not going to talk about that here. We're going to focus about the SIS. And in this era of rising costs, you start to wonder, is this overkill? We like technology in America, but does it really change outcomes? And so there's a very small minority of the papers that say that if you're really good, you don't need SIS. And that may be true if you're really, really good. So here's an example of a small polyp right here. And I think we would all agree that it's there. And you see it much better on the SIS. But conversely, take a look at this case. Here's the midline. And then to show you that I'm not cheating, I'm sweeping from side to side, showing you the entire endometrium. And even retrospectively, this looks normal to me. We do the SIS, and there's an obvious bump, plain as day. So the overwhelming bulk of the literature says the transvaginal ultrasound is not good enough there. And just picking one paper out of there, a quarter to a third of the women with a normal transvag had an abnormal SIS. So what are the indications for SIS? Pretty much anything to do with the endometrium, any kind of anything that you can think of. One of the classic indications is discordance. Here's a 48-year-old who had irregular bleeding. Her stripe was 17 millimeters there. Her path showed normal endometrium. Well, we've got discordance. We've got normal path at EMB, but we have an abnormal stripe, and she's symptomatic. She's bleeding. And as we said before, endometrial biopsy is pretty good for cancer, but it's awful for focal lesions. So we went and did this SIS, and here you can see an obvious in three planes right here, large four centimeter polyp, and that explains her bleeding. So our main goal is distinguishing focal disease from diffuse disease there. We're actually pretty good at distinguishing polyps from cancer, from fibroids, but we're not good enough. So a bottom line, focal masses go in the bucket. Focal masses are surgical masses. Um, preparation is key. We already had the quote from John Wooden. If you like military metaphors for semi-surgical procedures, a pint of sweat will save a gallon of blood. So we schedule a patient early in her menses. We give some Motrin a couple hours ahead of time. You want to be a nice person and she'll be less anxious. There are a couple other exceptions um, here, but those are so unusual. Just take a look at the paper we wrote on this. So why scan during days four to seven? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one, you don't want to scan a pregnant patient. You don't want to put a catheter or fluid in there. So that's probably the main reason. Number two, um, you're not going to have as many false positives, both in the adnexa and in the endometrium, because you're not going to have as many ovarian cysts that you have to follow, and you're not going to have the really funky appearance to the endometrium. So here's an example from a really nice paper by MJ O'Neill, and she shows on day 23 this very lumpy, bumpy secretory endometrium. Could any of these be a polyp? Sure. Could any of these be a cancer? Sure. 
and then she brings her back and on day five it's completely normal. So if we scan patients in the second half of their cycle, we're going to create a lot of havoc. So we just want to make a habit of scanning everybody early in the cycle, then we get beautiful images like this. Now obviously some women with abnormal bleeding aren't going to know when their period is, so you just take them when you do them. But many times you can make these studies diagnostic. Here are two different patients who had blood in their cavity, but you use the probe to kind of blot it, break up the blood, suck the fluid in and out, and you can generally get a diagnostic study. It just takes more work. So in terms of timing, uh, what's the optimal time to schedule either transvaginal or SIS? You have a bunch of options, and again, the optimal time is day four to 10. Now you could say day five to nine, day four to nine, but somewhere in there. What are the risks? Patients usually experience a little cramping because you're distending the endometrial cavity, so they think they're having their period. They may or may not have a little bit of spotting. You wanna consent them for infection, endometritis or UTI, but at knock on wood, I've never had one. These are really, really unusual. Vasovagal reactions do occur. I've had two and they've been very severe. So you wanna be very gentle when you're inflating the fluid there. One of the things we worry about, one of the theories for endometriosis is retrograde menstruation. And you think we're putting fluid in and washing the endometrial lining into the peritoneal cavity. So that is a theoretical concern, but without going into the details, it's not a practical concern. It doesn't happen. Uh, in the same vein, you have upstaging. You're scanning postmenopausal patients who are bleeding, who may have endometrial cancer, and do we worry about blowing the cancer cells out into the peritoneal cavity and um, upstaging them there? We had a nice paper where we put uh, baggies over the end of the fallopian tubes and then did SIS's in the operating room, collected the fluid and looked at it. So bottom line, it's theoretical concern, but it's not real. And there's lots of data saying that prognosis does not change when you do an SIS or an HSG in patients with endometrial cancer. And finally, perforation should essentially never happen. Here's our typical tray set up for an SIS. You can, you know, modify this however you want. Uh, the catheter, like so many things in life, it's the operator, not the equipment. This was a nice study where they used six different catheters and 600 women, and there's not a big difference there. Um, we tend to use these specialized endometrial or SIS catheters that you see on the left, which are more or less modified Foley catheters. I like these, but if you're doing mission work in Africa, you can use a small diameter Foley. You can use a five French soles catheter. In the middle is an example of a Goldstein catheter. So all these things work. Choose the correct speculum. There are basically two types of specula. There is the Peterson and there is the Graves right there. Um, it doesn't matter that much, but a medium Peterson's kind of small. It's nice to start with. If you have a multip who's uh, obese, you may want to go with a large Graves there. Try to get the lighted speculums if you're lucky enough to have them. Many places aren't, so we just use the standard metal. You want to insert the speculum. Oh, and backing up in terms of the type of speculum right there. If you have it, get the kind that is open on the side so that it's easy to take the uh, speculum out without dislodging the catheter. But again, many times we don't have access to those, so you just have to feed the catheter down the speculum while you're removing it, and that works. Um, to insert the speculum, make sure it's warm, make sure it's lubricated. When you go in, go in at a 45 degree angle and cheat posteriorly because the anterior introitus near the urethra is a lot more sensitive. So come in and push posteriorly. Once you get it in, turn it straight up and down. And here's just a diagram from Bates's guide, uh, just beautiful images in there. Then you open up the speculum, and here is the os, just looking at it straight on right there. This is where you want to spend your time. You really want to get this picture right here, have good lighting so that you can get this, because if you try to cut corners here and the os is up to, off to the side, sometimes you can pass the catheter in, but sometimes it gets very difficult. So do it this way and it works easier. The next most difficult part of the exam is to pass the catheter right here. And, you know, people ask, well, how often are you going to have problems? And the answer is it depends. If you have an 80-year-old who's never had kids, you're more likely to have cervical stenosis. 
Whereas if it's a 40 year old who's had eight vaginal deliveries, it's probably gonna go pretty easily there. If you have a cervix that you just can't get through, the first thing I generally try is a uterine sound. Always use the smallest one. Our trays come with all of these, but I always use the skinniest one. Remember, we're not sounding the uterus. We're just trying to get up the cervix. We just want a little bit of pressure right there. You can use a specialized catheter. A buddy of mine who's an REI doc told me about this egg retrieval catheter. This is really nice here. This is the patent egg retrieval catheter, but I'm sure there are other bands out there. Um, you can just use a conventional 038 inch glide wire and put a five French ca uh, dilator over it and that'll work. Um, you can also use a tenaculum, but remember that um, if you use this, you want to apply it properly. So the cervix has, let's get back to our diagram here, the cervix has its blood vessels coming in at the 9 o'clock position and the 3 o'clock position. So you want to put your tenaculum at noon right there. And again, we are not doing surgery, so you need just a little traction. So just put that down one click, go very slowly, and you'll get enough purchase right there. When you put the balloon in, put it in slowly. When you inflate the balloon, inflate the balloon slowly. When you infuse saline, infuse saline slowly, and that will um, militate against a vasovagal reaction. Remember that you could have a polyp hiding behind the balloon in the lower uterine segment. So when you're done, you want to deflate the balloon and then just pull out so that you get a nice look at things. You want to try, as you get more experienced, put the catheter in the cervical canal. We had a paper in the Green Journal a couple years ago where somewhat counterintuitively, it actually hurt less if you inflated the balloon in the cervix than in the endometrial cavity. So this is from the literature here, just showing the um, balloon inflated in the cervical cavity on a hysterocell pingogram. And here's one of our studies where we've got the balloon inflated in the cervix right there. And the nice thing about this, A, it hurts less, and B, you use less fluid because you don't have to do pull-out imaging because you can see the entirety of the endometrial cavity. The flip side to this is that about 10% of the time the balloon's going to pop out and you have to put the speculum back in. Again, failure rate depends totally on your pretest probabilities right there, but it's around 10%. As you get better, you'll have many fewer failures. Um, and remember that gynecologists working in the office 10% of the time, they can't get in at office hysteroscopy. What are some of the false positives and problems? You can have air bubbles, the balloon obscuring the lower uterine segment, crud uh, mimicking polyps, mechanical shearing of the endometrium, doing your study at the wrong time in the cycle. So here's an example of air bubbles right there. And you can generally figure that out real time. Again, we have to deflate the balloon to examine the lower uterine segment properly. Um, if you have some grunge within the endometrial cavity like we do here, you can deflate the balloon, kind of scoop it in, break it up, suck it out, put in more fluid, and then you get a really pretty study. You can have blood clots that mimic focal masses, as we see here. Could any of these be a polyp? Could any of these be a cancer? Absolutely but we spent some time breaking these things up mechanically, sucking the fluid out, and in the bottom right you can see we get a pretty study after some effort. If you're scanning in the secretory phase, which you really don't want to be, but you can shove the catheter in and raise a flap and get a false positive for a polyp. Color Doppler, the rule in the books is that a polyp contains a single vessel and fibroids contain multiple vessels. This is true most of the time, but there are a lot of exceptions, so it's not pathognomonic and you can't use it reliably. If you have 3D, by all means use it. You know, so here's an example of a couple polyps there. In reality, I think cine mode is just as good, um, but if you have the 3D, it's great to use. And here's just an example of a pre-3D getting the C-plane there. So which of these four patients has a malignant cause for postmenopausal bleeding? And we see bumps in all of them, but this turns out to be retained products of conception from MJ's article. Here's a bunch of polyps. Here is a fibroid, and this is the endometrial cancer right here. So we're pretty good at making path diagnosis, but not good enough. So in terms of pathology, um, we'll start with endometrial polyps. They're typically homogeneous, hyperechoic with a narrow base.
They account for about 30% of postmenopausal bleeding. And what you want to do is tell your gynecologist how many they are, where they are, what the base of attachment is. So we have longitudinal and coronal planes and multiple polyps. And again, we can't make histodiagnosis. This looks like a polyp here. It's great. It's homogeneous. It's hyperchoic. But when it was whacked out in the top right corner, there was a small focus of grade one adenocarcinoma. Here's just another example, you know, and hopefully I'd call that on EV, but you wonder if you'd pass by it. But here it is on the SIS. Here's another example. Here's an obvious polyp here. But then what's this hiding behind the balloon? So remember, you always have to deflate the balloon. And here you can see the solitary feeding stock of a second polyp. Fibroids are really, really, really common. The bottom line on these is you want to figure out whether it's more half in or half out. If it's more than half in, you can do a good job removing it hysteroscopically. But if it's more than half in the myometrium, you end up needing to go to a myomectomy. So that's the information we want to give our GYN docs. So here's just a classic appearance of a fibroid. You have this cap of endometrium on top, the fibroid here. And obviously, both of these from MJ's article are projecting into the cavity and can be removed hysteroscopically. Here's one, you know, would you call that? Transvaginally might be tough, but with the SIS, it's really easy to call, and you get a sense of how much of it is sticking in the cavity, and here you see multiple blood vessels in it. Here's another one right here, and again, it's pretty easy to see that most of this is sticking in the endometrial cavity, so it can be removed hysteroscopically. Here's another one right here, classic appearance, multiple blood vessels, and you can see it nicely outlined by that thin cap of endometrium. Hyperplasia makes up about 6% of postmenopausal bleeding, and there's a spectrum from simple hyperplasia without atypia all the way up to severe atypia, basically on the road to cancer right there. Same risk factors as cancer. So here you can see this irregular appearance here. This turned out to be simple hyperplasia. Here you can see something that looks like a polyp, but there was complex hyperplasia without atypia within it. Here you can see this plaque, and this turned out to be mild atypia. And then the reason we're doing this whole talk is endometrial cancer. Um, as we said before, it's the fourth most common cancer. It's typically broad and large, as we see right here. So which of these is not endometrial cancer? We're going to come back to this in a couple minutes, but I'm giving you four examples of abnormalities in the endometrium. So here's just a classic example, big lobulated mass, exophytic projecting into the cavity. Here's another cancer from PC. Here we had a cervical stenosis or occlusion with a malignant hematometros. You can see that there. Here's another one from MJ's article, very irregular, lobulated, maybe invading into the myometrium. You can see these look the same. And the key thing to remember here is that endometrial cancer can be very scarce and very infiltrative. So if you're not getting good distension of the cavity, um, worry that you have an infiltrative endometrial cancer there. And your odds ratio is around seven or eight with poor distension. And here's an experiment we did where obviously this patient was not complaining of pain when we were infusing fluid in. Clamped both fallopian tubes, got a great seal at the cervix, and pushing really, really hard, I could barely distend the endometrial cavity right there. And this was an infiltrating endometrial cancer. Here's one, looks great for a polyp, has a single blood vessel like a polyp, but at surgery, the bottom right corner of this had a tiny focus of papillary serous carcinoma. So um, again, focal masses are surgical masses. Then you look at this one, lobulated, hyperechoic, irregular. This is a classic appearance for endometrial cancer. Turned out to be breast cancer, metastatic to the endometrium. So we can't make path diagnoses. So which one of these is not endometrial cancer? And you can see multiple varieties right there. But these top two turned out to be cancer. This was cancer with, in a polyp, and this was breast cancer metastatic to the uterus. Um, can you use SIS and tamoxifen? Some people say yes, but the bulk of the majority says, 
Uh, the endometrium is always going to look abnormal in patients on tamoxifen. So talking to my gynoc friends, basically they don't recommend imaging, whether transvaginal or SIS, anybody on tamoxifen because it's always going to look abnormal. You just wait till they bleed and then you treat them at that point in time. You can use SIS to evaluate infertility. Here's a malaria infusion abnormality seen on SIS. Here's an example of Asherman syndrome following DNC. We had multiple adhesions. Uh, bringing the uterus down. We can look at tubal anatomy. We said that the only reason we're doing HSGs now is really to look for tubal fill and spill. Well, you can use ultrasound contrast agents, as you see in this video clip right here, and determine whether the tube is open or not. And the, we're obviously not going to get nearly as pretty pictures as we do with a conventional hysterosalpingogram. But if all we care about is the tube open and spilling, this is good enough. And we get a much better look at the endometrium with SIS. You can use fancy ultrasound contrast agents, or you can just grab some room air, put it in a 20cc syringe, and slam that in. In terms of intervention right here, um, bottom line, a couple people are working on this. This is from a friend of mine and he's very talented and he's got these Rube Goldberg type contraptions but it's not ready for prime time. So basically if you see a polyp then you need to go to hysteroscopy. How does SIS compare to other standards? It's as good as diagnostic hysteroscopy under general anesthesia at detecting focal lesions and it's better tolerated than an office hysteroscopy there. Another quote, you can avoid two out of three hysteroscopies. It's a lot safer, cheaper, quicker for the patient. SIS is better tolerated, requires less intervention, provides significant cost savings when compared to office hysteroscopy. So to sum up, we talked about why we worry, terminology and technique, what's abnormal in a variety of scenarios, abnormalities seen on transvaginal ultrasound, other diagnostic modalities like uh, DNC, endometrial biopsy, hysteroscopy. Then we had a talk within a talk on saline infusion sonohysterography, divided into overview, how to do it, and then examples of multiple different pathology. Remember, technique matters. Despite Tom Cruise buying his own ultrasound machine there, it really helps to know what you're doing there. So know how to measure it. Remember that under five millimeters reliably excludes endometrial cancer. Over 11 millimeters in asymptomatic postmenopausal women, not hard data, but most people would say biopsy at that point. And remember that SIS is easy to perform, works for all of us who are average, has a short learning curve, and is a really, really good test. And I want to thank all of these people for slides and pictures. Thank you.